Society for this year. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both the Orange County Land Trust and the Historical Society for sponsoring this event tonight. We appreciate everybody who's here and I'm very happy for a large crowd. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Town Board of Chester and the Sugarloaf <coughs> Performing Arts Center for the use of this facility again as we uh, had used it back in December. So it's a very appropriate uh, facility. As most of you know, uh, Dr. Hull, Dr. Richard Hull, is an emeritus professor of history from the New York University and a former board member of the Nature Conservancy, the Warwick Conservancy, and the Orange County Land Trust. He has served on the Sugarloaf Community Foundation and the Warwick Historical Society. A native of New York, Dr. Hull has lived in Warwick for more than 50 years and has been the official town historian of Warwick since 2007, and he has been a community leader since the mid-70s. He earned his PhD at Columbia University and is a Fulbright Fellow. He is a professor emeritus of history at New York University and an author of more than a dozen books. Before he gets started, I just want everybody to know that there's water over here and some snacks, and the Land Trust has some Save the Mountain t-shirts. The facilities are over here to the right. Ladies' room is on the right, and the men's room is on the left. Um, and emergency exits are here and back over here, in case that's needed. And without further ado, I give you Dr. Richard Hall. Before I begin, I just want to mention that beginning um, on the 6th of May, the Chester Historical Society is going to have an exhibition uh, down in, their, uh, in the renovated old 1815 Erie Railway Station in Chester Village. And that should really be exciting. They put a lot of work into it. There's going to be a lot of early photos of this area that I think will be really fascinating. And I think that's going to run until when? Uh, until October. Until October. The end of October. Yeah. So, yeah. so the end of uh, October. It's going to be long running. That's, that's very good. So everyone should be thinking about Sugarloaf now. Not only because of this exhibition, but because we, uh, uh, the Orange County Land Trust has been working on a campaign to save Sugarloaf Mountain and the, and the smaller mountains alongside of it, uh, the frame it. Uh, Mine Hill in the north, Grimstone Mountain on the south, uh, Hoop Snake uh, Mountain on the east, and then you've got this beautiful Sugarloaf Mountain. And we are in the process of of uh, raising funds to acquire that. It's about 350 acres and includes the old Palmer farm in the north end here too as well. So it's preserving farmland, <coughs> open land, uh, an amazing iconic landscape that can be seen almost all over the county. And because it is such an incredible landscape and strikes people when they come into the valley or really into Orange County, uh, it has been a source of attraction for people for not hundreds of years, but thousands of years. And we're discovering that because we've had some archeologists up there recently looking at Sugarloaf Mountain and they just, their jaws have been opening up. Oh my God, this, this, must, this would have to be a sacred place. And it certainly would have been a very important lookout for uh, the Lenape uh, peoples, Native Americans who lived in this area because this highway out here, King's Highway, was the old Wauwiana pathway that connected the major two meeting grounds of these people. Uh, just north of New Bergen, Baum, what is now Bonville, that was called Danskammer, and, and the Philadelphia area. So obviously you wanted to keep track of all the people that, are, that were going back and forth along, along that path. Uh, and it's also, uh, a group of us had, had uh, speculated on the possibility of a major trading post on the north side of the mountain, too. We see evidence that, that there must have been a lot of exchange going on uh, up in that area of all kinds of, all kinds of goods. So Sugarloaf has been an attraction not only for them, 
but it was an attraction for a woman in the Merrick clothes who came here after the Huawei on the patent was, was laid out in 1703. She came in uh, not many years afterward with her husband, and she said, you know, this area is going to be filled with farms. This land, this land is going to be cleared, and, and these farmers are going to need a provisioning community that can produce, that, that can repair uh, machinery, or uh, can take care of horses, can chew horses, can make wagons, and, and uh, barrels, and wheels, and blacksmiths to make uh, horseshoes, and so forth, and so soap makers, and so forth. And she had a dream. She had a dream for this area. So she bought it. It came out of the rutgers Hoagland tract, which was, which in turn came out of this larger 194,000 acre Wawriana pack. And so that's what you wanted to do with this community. And you'll, you can see by the foundations of the buildings along King's Highway here, that many of these houses were, were probably looked very much alike. <coughs> uh, you, you look at the foundations and they're almost, they almost all measure the same. So I don't know, maybe this was Orange County's first housing development. <laughs> yeah. But, it was, but it, it, was certainly, it was certainly an important community, more important than Warwick Village, and larger than Warwick Village, uh, before the railroad came, came through here in 1862. Uh, but just getting back to, to Sugarloaf Mountain, <coughs> that was uh, served as a beacon during the Revolutionary War. They have fires up there to uh, signal to people over on Mount Eve and Mount Adam and northward in the, in, in the, uh, shop, in the Spending Monk area. Uh, so it was important for that purpose. Uh, it was a center of mining, of iron mining, but it was very short-lived because they discovered there's too much sulfur uh, in, in the soil and in, in, the, in the mineral. So it was abandoned. You still see the, the excavations, uh, particularly on, well, Mine Hill. Um, and it was an area for herbs. Uh, one of the uh, professions in ancient and early Sugarloaf, colonial Sugarloaf, was soap making. Uh, so there were herbalists, there were soap makers, there were weavers, there were wood carvers, there were just a whole plethora. I mean, she wanted uh, key businesses here that will, as I said, service the area farmers. So that was her dream. And, and what I feel is the magic of all this is that we've come full circle back to that. Between the colonial period and the early period of, Amer of American independence, uh, Sugarloaf uh, was a sleepy, quiet little community. When I was a boy, 10 years old, I could bicycle through Sugarloaf, and there are only about four businesses, just basic business, like a general store and a GLF feed store for uh, feed for local dairymen. Uh, there are just very few. The, the only major industries was the, uh, Scott Poultry Farm right across the street from us here. Uh, he raised white layorns and sold them in New York City markets. And at the north end, where the post office is, that complex was Bucky Van Duzer's hatchery. And, uh, and he, he uh, bred uh, chickens and sold them all over the United States. Made a, made a considerable amount of money. He had his own airplane. He flew out to check up on his Leghorns and the West Coast or Missouri or all, all over the place. So uh, that was the situation. And, and the community's really great, greatest claim to fame was that this was where the great racehorse Hamiltonian was foaled. Uh, and Hamiltonian was a major stud horse. I mean, he, he impregnated many, many female horses and they became, in their turn, famous race horses. And, and Weistock was given this horse uh, by Mr. Seely, who was a farmer just behind us here, uh, because he didn't think Hamiltonian was ever going to uh, be a good race horse. Well, he, he was a pretty fair racehorse, but he was a fantastic stud. And this little stable boy who got Hamiltonian as a gift became one of the richest people in Orange County. He made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars 150 years ago. I mean, Hamiltonian died in about 1877 or so. I can't remember the exact dates. But, uh, so anyway, Sugarloaf was a sleepy little hamlet. 
it hadn't grown much in 80, 90 years, uh, and it, um, there wasn't much business going on in, in, in the community at that time. Now, what happened? What happened between 1968, let us say, and uh, 1967, 68, and 19, let's say 1975? This little community was almost totally transformed. But it was reinvented in the sense that uh, the, those businesses that Mary Close had in mind when she acquired this back in the, back in the 1730s um, returned. It was like ghosts coming back to, back to their central meeting place or something, or business. But within a very short time, and this is what my story is today, how did this all happen? Out of this quiet little village, this village was so quiet, there were no signs saying welcome to Sugarloaf. And when Route 17 was modernized, it became the quick way out here uh, in the 1950s, they couldn't even get a sign to say Sugarloaf. They, they, they got from the State Department of Transportation a sign saying Oxford Depot, <laughs> and Monroe, and Chester, and Gosh, and everything, but nothing that would lead you to Sugarloaf. No signs over here or over there or whatever. There was a post office. Yes, you could mail a letter here and get a stamp on your envelope saying, saying Sugarloaf. But very few people really knew much about Sugarloaf. And then suddenly, Sugarloaf became one of the premier community in America of artisans and craftspeople uh, overnight within half, a, within half a decade. Within half a decade, this all happened. And, uh, and so that's, that's what I really want to talk about. But just getting, once again, back to preservation. Um, Sugarloaf was always very interested in his history. And they always had some great historians here. Donald Burrell wrote a book along the way on the path. Uh, Helen Predmore wrote a series of articles on Sugarloaf history back in the 1950s. Uh, Mrs. Bill LaRue. Uh, wrote and lectured on Sugarloaf history back in the 1920s, um, and one, one, one could go on. Uh, so they had a sense of the past, of an appreciation of it, of its heritage, and so forth. But very few people outside of this area knew anything about Sugarloaf, and many people hadn't even traveled through here, and yet they were living in Orange County and other parts of Orange County, but they knew Sugarloaf Mountain. I, mean, I have lectured many times on the Sugarloaf Mountain Complex, and people come up to me after the lecture and say, oh, I live up in Middletown, and when I wake up in the morning, I can open my window, and I can look right out across the valley and see Sugarloaf Mountain. And I've heard people out in Pennsylvania near High Point say, I can look out over Orange County and whoop, that Sugarloaf Mountain, it's amazing. Sugarloaf Mountain be had always been an iconic Orange County landscape, and that's why we want to save it. Not just because it's a, a, a complex of beauty, but it's also a refuge for an amazing variety of birds, of reptiles, of plants, of herbs. The Indians understood that. Uh, an archaeologist recently said that had to have been a sacred place. That that, that mountaintop must have been sacred. Um, and uh, it's it, and, it, and it is potentially part of a vast corridor that's being assembled of land by three by Connecticut, well Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and that corridor is going to extend from the northwestern corner of Connecticut across the Hudson River, across Orange County into New Jersey, into northern New Jersey, Sussex County, across the Delaware, and into Pennsylvania. So that animals and people can travel that corridor, Mi migrating birds, migrating uh, deer and other animals, and plants can, can travel across that huge corridor. Uh, and so it's important that this complex, which is potentially contiguous to the Sugarloaf Mountain, or Kuspan Mountain State Park, which is this uh, 2,000 plus acre park, just over the way here, uh, and of course there's Sterling Forest Park just to the south, it's over 23,000 acres. Uh, 
and then the parks in, in, in northern New Jersey. Put all that together and you are looking at a, at a vast piece of, of land that needs to be preserved. So Sugarloaf must be part of that. Sugarloaf is, if the, if, we, if the land trust acquires this property, it will be actually contiguous to Goose Bun Mountain State Park. Uh, and Bear, Bear Mountain, and Harriman State Park, and so forth and so on. So um, it's, it needs to be done. A lot of people are concerned about this and involved with it. Uh, the Preservation Collective, uh, which is uh, led by Tracy Shu, who is a Sugarloaf person here, uh, that collective started just 20 years ago. They're celebrating their anniversary uh, this year. And they're responsible for getting the town to acquire a portion of the Baird Farm over here. It's called Knapp's View. It's about 90 acres of land as you come out of Sugarloaf on the right-hand side. Now that's Knapp's View, beautiful piece of land. That can be connected to all of this, too. Um, and so, and then you've got the Orange County Land Trust, which this year celebrates its anniversary, its 30th anniversary. And they have agreed to to, uh, to acquire this property. And the Palmer family who own it, uh, the, the estate uh, is, is a willing seller. So all the dots are in a row and we're getting close to reaching that goal and hopefully within the next month or so we will, uh, we will be able to have that and we were able, and then we can allow access to it without trespassing on people's property. That's another problem right now. I mean, you can't legally climb up to the top of Sugarloaf Mountain and see this beautiful county that we live in. You get a 360 degree panorama because they're pro private property owners. Uh, but this will en enable you ultimately to leave, to walk out this door, cross the way here, and the county has bought this corridor going right up to the mountain property, to the Palmer property. So you will be able to, to literally park your car in this area and walk right over it and up, and, and up the mountain. Uh, so it's really quite exciting. We're all very busy up about it. And, and this is one of the reasons why I've been lecturing around the area recently uh, to bring this to people's attention so you can, you can get behind us and support us. In this, in this endeavor. Now, I also want to um, apologize because this is a difficult subject, uh, studying Sugarloaf. It is so complex and it involves the dreams and activities of many people. Just in the last, uh, uh, since 1968, 69, many, many people came to Sugarloaf and opened businesses here. And many are still here. There are an amazing number of people who have been here for decades. Uh, the Dukes, Beth Duke, who has my sister's closet, this wonderful clothing store just down the street here. She's celebrating the 50th anniversary. Wow. When she first started here. <laughs> her 50th anniversary is, 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 is coming up. And there are others that are celebrating their 40th and their 25th and so forth. So it's, you know, this is something that when this started, everyone said, oh, this is just a fad. It'll pass. These are just a bunch of hippies. They'll go home again. Or they'll, 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 they'll win the more serious professions and maybe we will make them enough money to support their families and so forth. Now, families, many of them stayed here and raised families and bought properties, bought some of these buildings and raise their families upstairs, have their businesses downstairs, and raise their families upstairs. Uh, and I'll, if I have time, I'll just discuss a few of those families. Bet the Dukes are, are one of these families, raised a large family, and they've all gone on and are, are prominent people in, 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 their, in their careers. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why this community has been so enduring, because the craftspeople who came here often young in their 20s, single, stayed at, stayed here, married, raised families, and worked in the very buildings that they were living in and raised their families in. And uh, so it's, it's an enduring vision, but to my mind, it's magic to think that 
that one person's dream back in the 1730s when the Guamiana Path became King's Highway, the Colonial Highway, a major route, saw potential here for craftspeople, for artisans. And, uh, and, and it's come full circle again. And it gives me hope for the future as well. And I, and I, and I think this community has an exciting future uh, ahead of it. Yes, it's had its ups and downs. Um, there are times when it looked like it was failing, but it always came back. It has resilience, and I'll try to get into that tonight uh, as well. So what, I'm, what I want to begin saying is that Sugarloaf was made of personal dreams, personal dreams and enduring visions. It was a community, it is a community of dreamers and visionaries, of often independent-minded, creative, and entrepreneurial individuals. But it became more than simply a community. It, 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 more than just a, a famous site, uh, one of the major and earliest communities of craftspeople. I mean, this isn't a this isn't a museum village, as we have in Monroe, which is a wonderful cultural facility. I love it, but that's a recreated village. People don't live in museum village; they have these families in museum village. Uh, the docents, wonderful volunteers, dress up in costumes and pretend it's, you know, uh, 1820 or something. That is, that is not the type of community that Sugarloaf evolved into. This, this, should, this evolved into a community of working people, of, of people who have professions, and usually of small business people, too. That's another thing. These were small entrepreneurs. And, and why were they attracted here? Not just because of all the open space or the beauty, of Sugarloaf Mountain, that complex was attracted to them, just it was attracted to Native Americans centuries before. But it was affordable. One of the big issues that faces us in this country today is affordability. And affordability, especially for young people who, who are, want to be into raise families and build a career and so forth. Sugarloaf was, I, I hate to say this, and some people, some of the old timers would get mad at me, but I'm kind of an old timer too, so I bounce this off my back. But uh, it was a community that was that was poor. It was most of the people who had these houses. Some of them, I was just told the other day in a talk, uh, a woman who remembers going into some of these houses, and they didn't even have wooden floors. They had dirt floors, and they had uh, latrines in the backyard, and pumps, they pumped their water. And, and this was in people's lifetime today. Uh, remember that. Well, by the 1960s, many of those families had, had died of old age and their children had moved on and got a more substantial income and could move into communities like Wickham Village and so forth that began to emerge in the 1950s. And, uh, and so there was affordability. There's affordability because you can buy, now Jarvis Boone and Walter Cannon, who were who two were kind of, if you will, like the founders of this grand experiment. Uh, they bought their properties, their two buildings here, in, in, in 1967, 68, for $4,000. $4,000. Uh, and you can rent a shop in this town for $25 a month. Tim Dills, who had a frame shop here, and Deb, his wife, uh, they're another family that was raised here. They, the, uh, they said that they paid $25 a month rent for their shop here in Sugarloaf uh, when they opened it up in 1973. And we bought a house, my wife and I bought a house in Sugarloaf in 1970, and we pay an exorbitant, exorbitant price of, where's my wife, Joe? What was it, 25000 $30,000, a sizable house, a beautiful piece of property. Joe started her own business. I was a professor at NYU. We spent initially most of our time up here on weekends and summers, but I mean, there are bargains to be had here. So young people could come into this community and could afford to, to live here and, and have their business here make their home here. 
And then this big poultry farm, Scott's Poultry Farm, was sold in 1970. Mr. Scott wasn't making much money on it. He started a dance studio in this red dilapidated building across the street here uh, to supplement his poultry business. And he finally said, oh, I can't do it anymore. So in 1970, he sold that, the, the complex, the house, it was built in the 1790s. It's across the street. And all the coops. And the coops were transformed into a man bought, bought, it, bought the property, a developer. And he transformed those coops into stalls, into, sh into shopping, potential shops. And so many of the pioneer uh, craftspeople who came here, and artisans who came here in the late 60s and early 70s, got their start like Nixon Goley, who's done extremely well as an internationally known photographer and has his gout, still has a business right here in Sugarloaf. Uh, he was, in 1979, he came into Sugarloaf and started in a little, one of these little shops that had been a chicken coop just a few years before. And now he's got a lovely, beautiful gallery right here up on Main Street. So, uh, so affordability was what was one of the reasons. Beauty was another reason. Uh, the proximity to New York, uh, people in Bergen County would come up here. Uh, tourists would come uh, to to shop in Sugarloaf. The architectural diversity of Sugarloaf too. There's no one building looks much like the other. Uh, but I must also say, though, that Sugarloaf became more than simply a community, more than a community. It, was, it is a spirit as well. You don't have to live in Sugarloaf. You don't have to live in this little hamlet to call oneself a sugar loafer. Indeed, to be a sugar loafer, it's almost a state of mind. Yeah. People, people can live in uh, Fort Jervis or Warwick or Chester or whatever and say, I'm a sugar loafer. I don't live there, but I just believe in that entrepreneurial spirit that grows and thrives in, in sugar loaf. And that's the American way. That's the American way. And I feel the same way. So I'm a sugar loaf. <laughs> and, uh, and I can say the same thing about myself, too. We live in war, but I still feel like I'm a sugar loaf. We had a house here. We owned a house here for over 30, nearly 30 years. We now live on the old family farm in Warwick, but I still, when people ask me, well, what are you? I'm a sugar loaf. I'm a sugar loaf. So I think we, uh, we, we have, thank you. So we have an extraordinary community here in Orange County, one that we can all be proud of. We can all be proud of. It embodies uh, the hopes and dreams that made our country the great nation that it is today. But Sugarloaf also became a place where you could find unique items. You could find unique items. You could meet the makers of these items. You can get a personalized item. You can go into the shop and say, oh, gee, we're going to have a 30th wedding anniversary coming up. And I always wanted to have a, a type of duck or something. Or, uh, Mr. Boone, could you carve us this object or something? Like that? It, it, it was, you, you could go, you could come into Sugarloaf and go to a little shop and talk to the person who's going to make you something that you can't find in a super, in a mall. But you could find, you could have it made for you right here in Sugarloaf. <coughs> and you could get to know the maker. Who are you? What brought you to Sugarloaf? You know, how do you, and how do you make this? You, you, could go into, you could go into his or her shop and spend an afternoon and have a demonstration. You can sit in a chair and watch the person making you a beautiful, watch Ray Boswell or his son, who's also in the business. That's another thing. Some of these businesses uh, are second, third generation businesses here now. Uh, I mean, we're talking about since the late 60s. But you, you go into Boswell's Boss Tree store, that was the name of it, and he loved to show you just how he was going to make something. And he's so well known today, he goes all over the United States, he and his son, and sells many things to many of the Catholic Church 
many large Catholic churches around the country buy his his things for their for their rituals, for their services, and so forth. Um, and that so that that was very, that was very important too. That was another reason uh, that another way that people were attracted here, and they were attracted from all over the place. I mean, we have uh, uh, Jarvis Boone was from Arkansas, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, Arable, Arkansas. Where was it? Arable, Arkansas. Arable, Arkansas. Arable, Arkansas. Arable, Arkansas. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> but there, are, but but people came in from Wisconsin. Peter Lendon, I think, was Wisconsin. He's our candle maker. Um, they came from everywhere, uh, and we became famous here uh, as one of the great um, place centers for for culture for early American things. Um, okay, so you could buy them from someone who put their own heart and soul into making what you were seeing being uh, produced. And you could go to the actual place of creation, meeting the producers and watching it being made. Something very special. And the craftspeople could improvise, as I said, too. Make it just for you. Um, and they could show it. Uh, Susan Lobethetis, for a time, had her business called Sewing Machine Magic. And she would sit behind these looms and she could weave something, uh, a scarf or a blouse or whatever, and you could sit there and watch her uh, weaving. And that, just watching her doing that, it was almost magical. Just like watching Ray Boswell uh, taking clay and producing beautiful things um, and firing that clay and designing things from it. Um, it's also interesting that there, this place also attracted people who had a hobby, hobbies. They always liked working in wood, or always liked working in clay or, or stone or whatever. And, and they would say, gee, you know, I've got a little spare time on my weekends and summer and so forth. I'd like to rent one of these shops and become a, a you know, part-time uh, wood carver or whatever. And I can tell you, so many people started that way, slightly older people too, and they're not in their 20s, but they're maybe in their 40s and 50s and even in retirement coming to Sugarloaf because they always, they loved what they were doing, not their nine to five job five days a week, but gee, I wish I could just have a, my own little workshop and maybe even make, make a little money and supplement my own income so my kids, we can pay the tuition for our, our children and so forth. So we had a number of people like that coming in here, doctors, lawyers, professors, all kinds of people who just you know wanted that second profession? It started out to be a hobby, became a uh, you know supplement for their income and their love of things, and eventually evolved into a full-time profession where they retired from that commute and that terrible you know nine to five job to come here. And it was interesting too because you had the ability. You didn't have to have a nine to five shopping open. In fact, people used to complain because often uh, these stores are only open on weekends. And I can see, I can still see signs in some of the store windows right now, uh, open, let's say, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But the rest of the week, and you think to yourself, well, what are they doing for the other part of the week? Well, they're having fun making things in their little workshop the back or whatever uh, and so that's that's the way it, they, the, the way it was but all this kind of began with three dreamers Walter Cannon who was on the faculty at Hofstra in the Department of Athletics who almost died of an ulcerated condition in fact a priest came to wish you last to uh, uh, proclaim last rites uh, and they didn't think he was going to live but he miraculously survived. He said, well, this isn't for me. So his wife, who had come from Germany after the Second World War, uh, they met, they married, and she said, let's go up to Sugarloaf. This is where I was raised. 
would come up here and Walter, you always like beans. Why don't you why don't you take and a lot of barns, a lot of farms are going out of business now. Why don't you buy barns and take their chestnut and oak and whatever beans and uh, and put them in people's kitchens. More and more people want to have beams showing in their ceilings, in their kitchens and living room or studies and so forth. And Jarvis, or um, Walter Cannon then came up here in the 60s and started his business here uh, and bought some, some property here and started uh, taking down barns from here to Pennsylvania and, uh, and, uh, and selling them and making a lot of money from barn beams. People want to barn beams. And so Walter did that and he wanted to have his business here and he, raised, he would raise his family here as well. Uh, and then there was Jarvis Boone. Jarvis Boone uh, came, forgetting, where did Jarvis come from? Kentucky was it? Or? Arkansas. Arkansas. <laughs> he came from Arkansas. Oh, all right. And so Jarvis, um, Jarvis met Walter, and the two of them got together with a guy by the name of Jay Winograd, who I think was with the Chardonnay group uh, over in Warwick, as I recall. Uh, and they decided, hey, let's start buying up these properties. You can buy these properties in Sugarloaf for 4,000 bucks. So they came up with this idea of let's transform Sugarloaf into a community of, of grass people. Jarvis wanted a place where he could make his carvings, make his signs, and so forth. And so uh, Jarvis bought a piece of property right across the street from Walter. And the rest, the rest was was history. And they were great characters. They loved to talk. And Jarvis, particularly, Jarvis should have been in the theater because he, I mean, he just dressed like someone who should be on the stage in an off Broadway musical or something. Big barrel chest, with big hat, and so forth. And Jarvis and Walter just loved to talk about the, not only their crafts but the community. And and they be, and they began to attract the media. New York Times came up here in 1973 and, and, and wrote a big story about, about Sugarloaf. And, uh, and suddenly, business began to pick up. Uh, and the New York Times actually returned many years later to do a follow-up. And that, too, was very positive, a very interesting um, story. Uh, so a lot of media organs came up here, particularly radio stations would do little uh, episodes. Uh, on, on Sugarloaf. Uh, okay, now let's look at the diversity of the crafts that, that were developed here in Sugarloaf. In wood, of course, as I said, one thinks of Jarvis Boone, Walter Cannon, uh, back in the late 1967 when things were getting underway in their businesses. Uh, candle maker Peter Lended, graduate of the University of Wisconsin, very well educated, came here, and, um, and in 1968, early 69, he started Resplendent Candles, the candle shop here. He's still doing business here. He, he's, he, he's another one of those who's, who's celebrating decades of working and living here in Sugarloaf. Um, he came just as a college graduate, and now I think he's in his late 70s. Um, soap making, the Rosners. Uh, developed a soap store, made their own soap, tremendous variety of soap. Uh, and that store now is, is owned by um, Kat Perella. Uh, yes, Kat Perella. And she has a store called Merrily. And, it's, and she continues to sell soap. Uh, and she has Sugarloaf Mountain soap. It was a best seller. This is to raise money to save the mountain. And she made uh, what she thought was a sufficient quantity for Christmas, just before Christmas. And I think all of her soap sold out in a matter of hours, not even days. And so uh, it just really took off. But it, it, it's a delightful uh, store, one of the newer stores uh, in, in Sugarloaf. But soap, soap making, again, that went back to the colonial era. Uh, all, the, all these candles as well, the candle, can, there's a candle maker here 200 years ago. Um, leather, the Galushas and the Ajis, L.A. Aji, they had into leather. 
uh, and they just sold that that facility uh, just two, three years or so, maybe five, six years ago, I guess. And they moved to to um, Israel. He he was an Israeli, uh, and so you had you have that. You have artists like Eric Sloan. Now Walter Cannon met Eric Sloan. He loved Eric Sloan because Eric Sloan was one of the most famous artists painting barns in all, all, all over America. Very well known, enormously su successful. He approached Eric Sloan and said, I'd like to have an Eric Sloan day in Sugarloaf. And so that's what happened. Eric Sloan day started uh, in 1969 and it was held for many, many years. Every, every year, once a year, Eric Sloan would come up here with his most recent books. He was quite prolific and would sit out here on the, on the, on the, on the, out in front of the barn cider and, and uh, autograph his books. And he attracted a lot of people. Um, and then there was um, uh, Mary Endico. Mary Endico uh, was building a profession as, as a watercolorist. And she has been hugely successful. Tens of thousands of her works hang in houses all over America. She and, and Bob Fugit came up here in 1977, started in Scott's Meadow, one of those little shops. They called the business, her business fan, fan, Fantasy Factory. And they eventually moved up to Main Street, bought one of the properties on Main Street uh, decades ago, and they're still there uh, today. In photography, I've already mentioned Nick Sangoli. Nick came here in 1979. He's still here. He's still doing well. Photographing all over the world. He just got back from Tanzania and Kenya do, doing some shoots, and they will be shown very soon. You have Harry DeZanger. Harry DeZanger was one of America's foremost photographers of foods and had a, a, a beautiful studio just across uh, from uh, the New York Public Library uh, in Midtown Manhattan. But Ari had a place up here in Sugarloaf for a long, long time. And he went back to the 1970s here to raise his family here. In textiles, my wife, Jo, was a textile designer, worked in, uh, in uh, well, she called her business Babiga Batiks, and uh, she, she made these batiks in a little shop uh, attached to our house here in Sugarloaf, and that went back to 1970. And then, uh, and she teamed up with, with Jean Paulson, who was a companion of, of Peter in those days. And of course, uh, tied into that was the, um, was, was the, uh, well, I, I guess you could say Beth uh, Duke in my sister's closet, because she sold fabrics and, and, and clothing, women's clothing women's fashion and, and still is. Getting back to the arts too, I'm thinking of, of the Dilses, Dead and Tim Dilts in 1973 opened a business here in Sugarloaf uh, and they made frames for the artists who would come through. Out of, well, many of the frames were made from, from Barnwood and they just retired from that business after 45 years in it here in Sugarloaf. Um, in glass, Sugarloaf overnight became a center for painting in glass. There was a man by the name of John Bow who was very successful in designing store windows for some of the top stores in New York and Chicago and elsewhere. And decided he, he had enough of that. Had, had enough of it. Came up here and developed a business in painting on glass. And there was Al Terrell. He also became quite well known as a glass maker. Um, then we get into, uh, oh, and Joanne Menino, which is, is still another one. There were many people working in glass here in Sugarloaf in those early years and, and developed uh, successful careers. And ceramics, I mentioned the Boswell family. They came here in 1984. They're still here, and, was, and I said their son is in the business, uh, raised wife Terry became a jeweler. She had a jewelry business here as well um, for, for a long time. In Pewter, we had Joanne Sauer, 
who was a pewter smith. She came to us from Staten Island, I think, originally. There are lapidarians. I think I, that's the term. Lapid, people in lapidary and jewelry. Uh, I'm thinking of the woman who bought our place, Rachel Bertoni, yeah. Bertoni Gallery. She was very successful. She now has a store on Main Street in, in uh, downtown Warwick. Uh, but for years, she, uh, she had her jewelry store in our old house here. Um, and the Margolis family, Milton and Sylvia Margolis, had a jewelry business, a very successful jewelry business, jewelry design, retailing, and so forth, for many years here. Both grew old and passed away. Um, I'm thinking of music. Uh, Irving Rahman, his real name was Benny Rabinowitz, to us. But to the rest of the world, uh, he was Irving Rahman. And he became a nationally known com musical composer. Uh, and he put on music performances here in, in this building. He since has grown old and has passed away. But uh, he was quite well known. Red Grammar lived here. Uh, and called himself a sugar loafer. Uh, that was in the 1980s. Ray Grammer, who was a great lyricist and wrote wonderful children's songs, and was quite, quite well known in the 1970s and 80s. I haven't heard much from him since, but he won many Emmy Awards, uh, as has Jeff Zahn. Jeff Zahn is, has won Emmy Awards, and he is a sugar loafer, is on the board of the Sugar Loaf Community Foundation. And, uh, and, and is well known in the theatrical world. We had ironmongers and blacksmiths, Norman Paulson, one of the Denigers, I can't remember if it was George, does anyone know? Which, which of the Denigers worked in iron? Al. Al, Al, Al Denninger. Uh, <laughs> blacksmiths, again, coming full circle. This was a community of blacksmiths centuries ago. And in construction, uh, Don Duke uh, helped to renovate and redesign some of the buildings, repair some of the buildings, very skilled uh, working with, with wood. But he started out, he had a, a, a snack store, I guess you would call it, a fast food store here going back to the 1970s and then, went, and, and then eventually helped many people, including ourselves, to renovate our house, or Joe's shop, her boutique shop here. Uh, toy makers. We had Joanne Manley, who made dolls, sold in major stores all over America. And Jerry Abelman, who made children's toys in what we call Romer's Alley, which is a little alleyway just off of Main Street here. We had puppeteers. Some of you remember Dr. Nick. His real name was Will Pearson, William Pearson. Came from a prominent family in Warwick, and he made his, designed his own puppets, made his pu puppets, and gave performances here in Sugar Loaf year after year uh, with, his, with his puppets. Attracted a lot of, again, a lot of consumers. A lot of families with children would come into town, and while they were here, they'd go up to Main Street here and buy things uh, from the shopkeepers. Uh, more recently, we have Gloria DeHaan, who is an, an interior designer. Uh, she. Now, uh, as she owns the old Shaughnessy House, uh, just up the street here. And the area of horticulture, uh, Mr. Bonkenberg had a tulip business. He was a Dutchman who emigrated to the United States, came up to Sugarloaf, and opened a very successful tulip business. And he finally had to leave Sugarloaf, believe it or not, because he was allergic to grass, <laughs> to grass. And you see him mowing with him this elaborate mask over his face, and it really got to be too much for him. I think they, they moved to Florida, but for the state of Florida. But for many years, he had a very successful business right over the railroad tracks on the right-hand side uh, of the road there. And of course, there's Gene Corsini. Gene comes from a family of nurserymen, and Gene's family had a very active business in, uh, in northern New Jersey, um, and they came up here, and Gene, Gene developed a profession of building greenhouses, and he built greenhouses for businesses all over the region here for, for quite a few years, and he, and, he, and he has a nursery right here in Sugarloaf, 
I think he's got more than a dozen greenhouses of his own right in the back part of his property. And he uh, and his wife sell flowers. They're very busy right now planting things in the greenhouses, and they will be available. <coughs> and his wife, um, Alicia, uh, studied horticulture. She has several degrees in horticulture. And uh, Alicia has her own business here. She's an herbalist. She's an expert on tea as well. And many other things are, are sold, spices and other things are sold. And it's an amazing store that she had for a number of years. She first opened, I think, in about 2004, right up here, just a few doors up from Nick's and Golders Exposures Gallery. And now they moved everything to the, to the an historic farm here that goes back to the 1780s, 1790s. And he, uh, with his own hands and friends, restored that, that house, particularly the interior. And I should mention that because many of the craftspeople, because when they came here, many of them were not prosperous and couldn't afford to hire carpenters, so they learned the trade themselves and just bought hammers and saws and everything and started to improve the houses. And many of these houses were in terrible condition in, in, by the late 1960s. I can tell you that. And many of these, and many of these houses desperately needed new roofs and siding and porches and everything else. And many of these people, they might you know, have been potters or pewter workers or whatever, but they also got to be very handy with, with, with carpentry, with, with tools. Um, and so I think, um, we, we should think of them as well. So horticulture, horticulture figured largely. Uh, and herbalist, I mean, uh, Alicia is, has taken us back to an, an era when this area, as I said, was famous for herbalists going back to the Native American period and moving forward. Because if you walk through the Sugarloaf Mountain complex out there, you will find many rare plants that have medicinal properties. That's why this archaeologist who was examining this recently said, this had to be a spiritual place. Because this is where people could go to get help for arthritis or whatever was ailing them. They could come to Sugarloaf to, to, to get help from the herbalists. Um, in food, uh, my wife Jo gave up Petit making tie dyeing them because the chemicals that were used in the dyes were carcinogenic and we were raising a family. And she said, listen, I see too many people in my profession who are suffering from cancer. So she and my sister were asked by my parents who were celebrating their 50th wedding, wedding anniversary to throw a big party. And so my sister Susie and Joe uh, organized the whole thing, put it all together, and had so much fun doing it, they decided to go into the business of catering. And, and, and it came to be called uh, Canopy Capers. And they catered parties from Boston all the way down to, what, Philadelphia, I guess? All up and down this whole area, New York City, everywhere. And it all started right here in our garage that Don Duke came over and helped us to transform our garage into, into their business. And for, what, 26 years, I think, they, they had the catering business. And then eventually... <laughs> so, and, then, and then I'm thinking of Gail Link. Gail came into town and took the old Grange buildings, the last building on the right-hand side before you go over the railroad tracks here, and uh, she started the Sugarloaf Inn and advertised a new, the new American cuisine. And boy, I'll tell you, that was a wonderful restaurant. She had that for quite a few years, Gail Link. She too has passed away. So many of these people have reached extended, extended old age or have passed away, sadly. But um, that was a very successful business. And eventually, a fellow I think from Mexico, bought it and created a Cancun Inn. And that's a very nice restaurant. But that's not new American cuisine, it's Mexican cuisine. But same food business in, in, the, same, in the same building. 
Um, now, this area was also famous for, or maybe no, I should say notorious, for distilleries, for brewing uh, beverages and alcoholic, with alcoholic content. And going back even before the revolution, this area, when Erskine came here and did a survey for George Washington during the revolution, he commented on all the, all the distilleries and bars around here. He said, even a woman, I won't tell you her name because her descendants still live here, but this woman had her own very successful uh, bar right up at the top of the hill here, just before you turn into Ridge Road. That house used to be, well, the, the original house was torn down. That was built in the 1930s. But that was the state that her business. And that she was very popular. Well, prohibition ended uh, brewing around here and distilling. But we recently now have a new business in Sugarloaf, very successful business called the Tin Barn Brewery restaurant. It's in, it's in the old Genet auction house. And they, and this, he and his daughter, I think his name is Dan. Dale. Dale, yeah. Dale and Lauren uh, run this together. Father and daughter, they came over from Long Island. And boy, I'll tell you, the equipment, I'm sure they spent millions of dollars getting that business going. Uh, but they're doing apparently very well. I mean, from what I can see, and when I when we go over there, my wife and I go over there, there are always it's a, there's always a big crowd, and they are now brewing their own uh, beverages, and they've been uh, very well received. So here's another business that has come back, has been brought back to to Sugarloaf, um, and then there was an area of authors. I myself. Uh, was a professor at NYU and published a number of books. Um, two of them, maybe some of you have seen them. I, they're both out of print, unfortunately. Sugarloaf, It's History, Mystery, and Magic, 1780. And Sugarloaf, New York, The Enduring Vision, 1700 to 1997, and I must confess, this is, this is sold over 9,000 copies, and it's been out of print since uh, 19, well, the year 2000, I guess, the last. I, I have only six to my name, and so you know, people say, "Oh, Professor Hull, may I get, get one of your books? Where, where can I get your enduring vision?" Listen, I, I have trouble finding it. <laughs> I saw once in a while they appear on, uh, on Amazon, but... eBay. Um, eBay. And e maybe eBay. So anyway, that's, uh, that's another thing. And James Rogers, who is the senior editor for Scientific American, very distinguished uh, journalist and writer and scientist, lived right up just beyond here on that house on the right here. He and his wife, Jan Rogers, uh, uh, lived there for a number of years, and he commuted down to Manhattan to Scientific American just about every day from, uh, from Sugarloaf, from the station there. Um, and lighting. One of the most uh, famous experts in spotlights, theater spotlights, is Richard Lobethetis. And some of you And John was a great publicist. He was a guy who painted in glass. And John would just, every time he'd see somebody, hey, come up to Sugarloaf. Do you know anything about Sugarloaf? You never heard of Sugarloaf? Come on up next weekend and I'll take you on a tour. And I think that's how you got here, didn't you? To John Bone luring you up here. Open on Tuesday. Pardon? He was the only shop open on Tuesday at that time. There you go. The only <laughs> shop open on Tuesday. And that was in what, 1970? 80, uh, 74. 1974, and that's Susan, his wife, who I mentioned had the sewing business. But Richard invented, Richard started inventing spotlights when he was what, in third grade? Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Fourth grade, he came out with his first spotlight. Well, he now has a huge factory here in just right outside Sugarloaf. It's really Sugarloaf, though. 
and he employs, what do you, how many employees do you have? About 36. 36 employees, and they make spotlights for theaters all over the world. I mean, like uh, Radio City, right? Well, we do a lot of work with Radio City. Radio City, some of the great opera houses, uh, and they're all produced right here in Sugarloaf. And responsible for this whole complex that we're in right now because they Richard I guess especially was always interested in the theater that was one of his dreams to come up to Sugarloaf and open a theater here and they opened it in that dilapidated barn across the street the GLF feed store and dance hall on the second floor of Mr. Scott's poultry uh, operation and they started there and I remember in the 70s you had some wonderful stage some plays there Boston Dramatist here. 1974. 1974. We came up in May and the theater opened in December. In December, the same year. But that so, was John Ball pushing all the way. I'm sure, I'm sure. And so they went from there and to this. Over 700 seats in the theater, right? Yeah. And, and here's the pavilion up above. So we really owe a huge debt of gratitude to the little Fetuses for bringing to Sugarloaf theater. Because Sugarloaf, had, well, you know, Sugarloaf did have theater for a while, too. Across from the church was one of the most notorious bars in this whole area of Orange County. Directly across from the Methodist Church. And the Methodists, of course, are teetotalers. And, uh, and the, um, the, the church was, the property was given to the Methodists who, Methodism was in Orange County was founded here. This, this was a, one of the first Methodist congregations going back to 1809. And, uh, and in 1851, they acquired by gift a piece of property right here on Main Street. And they built this beautiful Greek Revival door temple building. And that, that's the architectural idiom. It's one of the best examples of that architectural idiom in New York State. And that will be on the historic register before long, national and state, because it really is quite extraordinary. And they designed it so it would be built directly across from that horrible <laughs> bar across the street. And so you could stand on the pulpit in that church and on a summer day, open the doors and look right across <laughs> to that place. I mean, it was more than a bar. I mean, it was really, really something. Else. <laughs> we had a history just on that. We write a nice article in the magazine on it. Maybe I'll do that someday. But uh, so, it, so it, it's interesting. You'll see them uh, just directly across across from each other. And the Methodist Church flourished here. The Methodist Church. This church kind of became the lead church of Methodism all over Orange County. Uh, and they had circuit riders who would, who would come and preach on a, on, a, on a Sunday, and then they'd ride their horses off to another congregation, preach there either the same day or the following Sunday or, or whatever. So um, this was also then uh, an important center for religious observance and the, through the Methodist church. Um, now, tourism. Tourism, this was timely here because just as this was developing came that I love New York scheme. Let's, let's try to, to keep tourists here in New York. Let's show people that there are interesting places to visit right here in New York. And right in the Hudson Valley, the County of Orange started the Office of Tourism. The state has started now has a very large office of tourism. And uh, so we, we had the resources from the county, from the state, and ultimately from the town to promote uh, this area as, as, as a destination uh, for, for tourists. Um, okay, so, and Eric Sloan Day became important, and that became an annual event. Uh, from 1969 to 1986 when Eric Sloan passed away. Um, and then in 1969, 
the Sugarloaf Craftsman Guild was launched. That was like a chamber of commerce. Um, and they sponsored jury art shows right out here in the street. Artists would be invited and they, they uh, have, have their exhibitions right on the street. But that became very dangerous. The first time they did that, they attracted over 4,000 people on one day. Imagine this little sneaky little hand. Ten years before, there were more than maybe 50 cars that traveled through Sugarloaf, and most of them never even bothered to stop. And here you have 4,000 people coming here, crowding here on, on the on this for this for this art show, and so that became very popular. And they began to um, to have craft fairs. 1974 was the first craft fair. Um, and that was held in the fall and in the spring. And that continues. In fact, I should mention that I think it's May 7th will be the spring craft fair here in Sugarloaf. Uh, and it's not just for Sugarloaf business people, but they invite crafts people from all over the place. They can come here and set up their own little uh, businesses out on Main Street. But that was very dangerous because suddenly Main Street was filled on weekends with people running, dashing, darting back and forth across the street, and traffic along King, King's High was growing tremendously with developments occurring like Wickham Village, Wickham Knowles over here, the Mari uh, large subdivision and so forth. It, it was really getting to be very crowded, and people were being injured and killed. A young woman lost her life, just three minute walk right out here on the near, near next uh, gallery. Uh, she was run over and killed. And we came to the realization that we have to build, a bypass needs to be built around, built around Sugar Road. So when we have these occasions, we can close this part of King's Highway off for a day or two, or perhaps uh, even longer. So um, we started agitating the town, or the county, I should say, to build a bypass. And that was finally achieved in 19... Uh, or when was it, 1992, I think. And, um, and now we have a sugar load bypass. Uh, but that's become very controversial because now uh, sugar load would like, many people in sugar load would like to have the town take over this section of the county highway so they can have a little more control over its use, speed limits, lighting, and other things. So that's a campaign that is ongoing right now to try to persuade the county uh, to sell it or to transfer it to the town. Most of the town leadership now uh, supports it as well. Okay, so you have the crafts fairs, you had the media like the New York Times beginning to uh, write stories about this. Um, in 1969, we see the formation of the Sugarloaf Craftsmen's Guild. Uh, annual jury art shows uh, were sponsored by the uh, Craftsmen's Guild. Sugarloaf uh, Chester was rezoned in 1974, and a special zone was created here called LBSI, Local Business Sugarloaf, to allow these local businesses to remain here. But that was very controversial as well, uh, for reasons we just don't have time to do uh, this talk. By the way, the New York Times for piece of first one in 1973 was entitled Sugarloaf makes its way, literally. Very clever, very clever story, and widely read. And then in 1979, the Sugarloaf Community Foundation was organized. This was the first municipal foundation of its kind in New York State at the time, believe it or not. I can't, I can hardly believe it, but apparently I've been told that it was. Uh, and the Sugarloaf Community Foundation was Organized, they drew a large number of people within two years and had just, I think it had 198 members. Um, and uh, it was mainly to promote the culture of Sugarloaf. We, we put up some highway markers, like one at the end of the road here uh, uh, that, we, that we installed. We set up a scholarship for students in, in uh, Warwick schools, because we're in the Warwick School District. We, uh, we encouraged uh, beautification. We planted many trees 
uh, many flowers. That's still done every year. A park was set up in memory of Milt Margolis, one of the people who had the lapidary shop with his wife, Sylvia. He died suddenly of a stroke, and we took a little piece of property and created a mini park right here as you come out of Sugarloaf and get back onto King's Highway, uh, just beyond the post office. That's Margolis Park. And so we created a, a mini park. We, uh, we sponsored guided tours. Uh, of the community. We, um, we sponsored a music series in 1985, a uh, concert series, first held in the, in the uh, community uh, the Sunday School Fellowship Hall of the Methodist Church. They very generously uh, gave us an opportunity to start our concerts there. And they ran off and on for a number of years. The, the last series was right here in the theater, wasn't it? Uh, uh, when when uh, uh, Irving Rahman, uh, he produced something that he had composed. He was a composer. They had the Hudson Highland. Yeah. It uh, was a chamber orchestra. Yeah, chamber. Sort of a house resident. Yeah, yeah. And so then Sugarloaf did that. And in 1987, we began to publish our own newspaper called Sugarloaf News. This was a quarterly. And it helped strengthen a Sugarloaf identity as well. It was a very, very nice newspaper, very professional looking and everything. And that, that ran for quite a few years and was quite, quite popular. And then in 1989, uh, the Sugarloaf Chamber of Commerce was established, and that is still in operation as well as a community uh, foundation uh, here as well. Um, it also uh, sponsored community breakfasts and so forth. Um, okay, we're running out of time, so I want to speed ahead. There are a number of things I. Oh, yes, about the church. The church was, the congregation was shrinking over the years. Uh, I mean, we used to come up here and occasionally, because uh, we were living in New Jersey and we had the farm up here in a couple of weekends, and often we were coming up on a Sunday. We just stop off and attend a service in the Sugarloaf Church. I mean, this was about 1950, 51, and my father one day said, boy, this church, I think I did this church about five more years to survive because the congregation had shrunk down to such a small number. But then, what happened? Then a man by the name of Arthur Hewitt, a very charismatic, uh, highly educated pastor, was appointed to our little church here. And he was so inspirational. And there are a lot of families moving in here, especially over in Wickham Village, and, and the developments just beyond us here off of Wood Road. And they had kids. And so some of the members of that congregation, the bankers, and the colleges, and, and other members of the church, got together and built that fellowship hall as a Sunday school. And that opened in about, uh, it was about 1986, I mean 1976, no, 1967, 68. And suddenly the church grew with Arthur Hewitt as pastor with his wonderful Sunday school. I mean the Sunday school was back, had practically died by then. The Sunday school came to life again and, and the church really began to be a major force within within the community once again. And uh, so that that was also something that I think need, needs to be uh, said. So um, that added an additional uh, point of attraction. Okay, um, now 1993, the Logothetis uh, opened the Lyceum Theater Center. And, and really brought in world-renowned people to the stage of the Lysing and Theater here. People like Julie Harris. People like Richard Kiley, who lived in Warwick. He was the guy who started a man of La Mancha. Very, very, very well known throughout the United <coughs> States and, and globally. We had the New York City Ballet Company, a famous Russian ballerina, uh, yes. performed here. Um, we had Arlo Guthrie here at one point. Over a thousand shows. 
over a thousand shows, over a thousand shows. So we had a spiritual center, we had the cultural center, we had the shopkeepers, we had, and we still had working farms, a lot of working farms. That was another lovely thing about this. Sugarloaf was surrounded by farms. The Baird Farm, the Baird Lee Farm, to the north of us, that's now a vineyard, but that was uh, for generations a huge, one of Orange County's biggest dairy farms. And we had on this side, we had the LaRue Farm, another dairy <coughs> farm. We had the Banker Farm, another dairy farm. We had the Blivin Farm, another dairy farm. I mean, we had our own family orchard, Applewood Orchards, which my brother had, was one of his dreams, coming out of Cornell studying pomology. Um, and that is still in operation today. We still, still have about 1,200 apple trees that one of my nephews has and manages and sells his fruit. As it's a pick your own. So that was another point of attraction. Here we were, right in the New York metropolitan area, and still surrounded by lovely mountains in the wintertime, looked like the sugar lows of the pre-colonial period. When you went into a store and you wanted to buy sugar, you buy it and, a, and something looked like a loaf. And they, and they cut the pieces of sugar out of that loaf to sell you. That's how th that got its name, sugar loaf. I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know the Lenape name for it. But, uh, that became the name even before, well before the American Revolution. In fact, the Mary Close. And um, what did I want to say about that again? Well, okay. Just the, the beauty of this area attracted people. The fact that they could, they could buy. I mean, when I was a kid, there was a German farmer next to us, and he kept such a, my father was a medical doctor, so he was very much uh, concerned about bacteria. And uh, he wanted very clean places, uh, places that were serving food, to be very well maintained. And this German farmer, he had a tiny <coughs> farm, he had 12 cows, but it was so well maintained that he, my dad, would only have us drink unpasteurized milk. So back in the 50s, we really only had unpasteurized milk when we were up here in the country and, and doing our, our shopping from his, from his dairy. So these, these were things, oh, and also, today we're all very interested in organic everything, organic food, organic, going back to original, no, you know, as few chemicals as possible in your, in your diet and everything. Well, this, was the home, this was the beginning of the, bi of the organic, biodynamic, non-chemical farming movement in America. It started in the general store across the street, Conference General Store, around a pot belly stove. And there would sit, when I was a boy, Dr. Aaron Fried Pfeiffer and J.I. Rodale. Some of you may know Rodale. He began with the most famous people in America in terms of promoting uh, <coughs> natural foods or organic foods. Well, Pfeiffer had a farm right outside of Sugarloaf here. And on, on weekends, early in the morning, Saturdays, he, he would come down here and hold forth at Rodale. And they were, they strongly influenced the woman named Rachel Carson. And Rachel Carson came out with a book, um, Silent Spring. So it happens when you get into your 80s. Yeah. Yeah. It's very quick. Silent Spring. And, and she was very much under, under the influence of Dr. Pfeiffer and Rodale, and there are a number of other people who would gather and talk about all of this. And we're doing organic farming here back in the 1950s. Organic farming, 1950s. It's amazing. And they were considered, considered rather nutty. <laughs> but my father fell in love with this whole movement, <clears throat> sponsored by the Anthroposophical Society, which was founded in, I think, Germany. In fact, many of these people, like Pfeiffer, came over here uh, when the Nazis took power in Germany. They pulled it up and they immigrated here. It's like Kurt Sedeman, who was one of the great surrealists in, in, in art, uh, bought a farm right over here in 19. 51, I think it was, and uh, and he had a studio here, and all the great artists 
of the early 20th century, like Chagall, uh, would come and visit him and, and, and would paint in the barn right over here uh, at, at that time. And he too was, he was a, he was a member of, he was a Jew, lived in Germany, and had to flee. And on his way, he met this beautiful woman, Arlette, and she came from one of the most prominent art families in Paris. And they got married and came over here and settled right over here in, in Sugarloaf. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, and then in 1994, she passed away. He had, he had died uh, in 1962, quite suddenly, probably through suicide, we believe. Um, but anyway, he passed away. She remained farming. Here, this woman who came from a very wealthy Parisian family who had an incredible art collection. And she lived in the farmhouse and kept chickens and milk cows over there and everything. A woman who was, really came from enormous wealth, but she didn't want to live that way. She remained on this farm. She died in 1992, I think, 93. And she, it was arranged that she would give in her estate that property. It was 53 acres. And that was given to the Orange County Citizens Foundation in 1994. And that's called the Sutherland Center after, uh, after uh, Mr. Sutherland. Um, okay, we're almost out of time. Is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, oh, going back to the Frosinis. Um, Jean, and I guess Alicia had a role to play as well as wife, have developed what they call the Labyrinth Garden. And uh, as I said, his family had been in the gardening business for generations. And he really knows his stuff, both of them do. And they created this Labyrinth Garden, and it's open really to the public. So in the summertime, if you're in town, Go over and take a look at that garden. It's maybe the size of this room or so. It's, it's, a, uh, it's really something that, that, that should be seen. Um, so I think that's part of artisanship as well. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, you know, I should also mention another, another business that came to Sugarloaf become very successful, is Fabco, F-A-B-C-O. That, uh, uh, Robert Fury, Bob Fury, bought the Morrison Baird Farm. There were two Baird Farms. And he bought one of them and, um, and, and moved his plant. It's a, it's a business that manufactures generators, state-of-the-art generators, very advanced generators that use in very special environments. And they're manufactured <laughs> right here right in our neighborhood here. But Fury also became, they, they came in in 1979, but he has become a great champion of land preservation. He has kept the old farm, and now he calls it the Fury Brook Farm, next to his factory. And his daughter, Tracy, founded what is called the Preservation Collective, and which I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture. And the Preservation Collect Collective was responsible for saving the other, well, part of that farm. And that is now called Knapp's View. It's about a 90-acre tract of land. You come out of Sugarloaf, it's on the right-hand side. It's a beautiful hillside. And it runs right up to the property that the land trust will hopefully be acquiring in the next few, within a month and a half, hopefully. And, um, and, that, and that marked the beginning of the preservation collective. That was just 20 years ago now, 2003. And they've gone on, Tracy and her group have gone on, trying to clean up landfills, acquiring other tracts of land, and doing a lot of really important environmental work. Not just here, but all over the county. All over the county. So uh, keep an eye out for the preservation collective, because I think they're, uh, they're definitely uh, a getting to be a force uh, in our area. Okay, um, and by the way, there's another business of more than one generation. Uh, Bob Fury is still alive. There are three generations now that are in the FACO business. Again, it's 
what I'm talking about, the, the continuity, the stability of distances here. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, okay, oh, and, the, and this complex, the theater complex here, um, was eventually the Logothetis's ownership that passed from the Logothetis's into an entity that didn't, I, I don't think, did a very good job of making costs. I've got board of directors, they blew it. <laughs> board, the board of directors. So the theater closed for, what, two years, I think? No, it was being used, but it was being used by another organization. And then, you know, with the our help, whatever, ultimately the town made a bid on it. Yeah. And so, there were other bidders, but the town won out on it. Yeah, so the town of Chester acquired this. And I think that was a wonderful thing, too. I mean, this is now a, a town of Chester facility. And, uh, and under the current management, it looks like they're really doing very well. I, I had, we had our grandchildren up here two weeks ago for a musical production. Uh, and, uh, and the place was jammed. Ah, well, wasn't it, Joe? There were probably 650 people mm -hmm. over there. Pardon? Kids. Kids. Yeah, too well and their parents. Children, children and their parents. <laughs> But this is what we want here, don't we? We don't want just a bunch of old folks, old folks themselves. But we need to get some young people around here as well. We, we, young people have to fall in love with this area too. I, I often like to say that I fell in, I really fell in love with this area when I climbed to the top of Sugar Road Mountain. We had just purchased the farm. It was 1949, and I was nine years old, and I resented the fact that we had bought the farm because I was raised down in New Jersey, and all my friends were down there, Ruby, New Jersey, Bergen County. And this was like a gulag to me, being <laughs> sent up here for the summer, not enjoying my friends. But I walked to the top, walked up to the top of that mountain, because shortly after my parents bought the farm, uh, the, uh, the former owner said, now you have to climb Sugarloaf Mountain. Now take Dickie, he'll, he'll look. That's me. He'll, he'll just look. So we walked up to the top of that mountain, and I looked out over 360 degrees, looking around like this, and I thought, holy smokes. I never in my life up until that time been able to have that kind of a vista. I mean, I was totally captivated by it. I came down from the Sugar on the Mountain, and I said, okay, I think this is all right. I think we're going to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> and, uh, A love affair with our Sugar Love Mountain and with ultimately with a hamlet here as as well. Um, okay, I think oh the future. The future. Historians sometimes forget about talking about the future. And what's the important the most important thing about history is that not only to understand the past or where you come from, but as Abraham Lincoln once said, uh, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from or what's happened in the past? And so um, what, what do I envision for, for Sugar Land? Well, one thing, one immediate thing, one, I've been going around town and I apologize if I haven't interviewed one of you and you're a shopkeeper, but I just didn't have the time to visit every shopkeeper. But I visited a few and one of them said, you know, that old dilapidated barn across the street there. This is Scott's old barn. That's in terrible condition. It's an eyesore, and I certainly agree. It's a terrible eyesore. It has been <coughs> occupied in years now. And it's right across the next beautiful exposures gallery. Why doesn't the town, now the county just bought that property. They tore down almost all the old chicken sheds that were the shops of all these artisans I've been talking about. Uh, why don't they take that and start another um, place where young people can afford to open up businesses, can start their businesses? And you could have stalls, you could rent stalls. And I went over and looked at it the other day, and I figured just as I read Bart on Love and the two floors, you could get more than a dozen people opening businesses in there. And while they tore down most of the coops, they did save one of the buildings back there. It's in very good shape. And I looked at that from the outside, and I said, boy, we can get another dozen 
people in there. And then I looked at a house built in 1779, which is in derelict condition, hasn't been occupied in years, and it's falling apart, and has now become an eyesore. We store that, we store that, and we can have a little museum here if we want to, or a gallery space or something. So the argument is that that property can make money, but it can do even more. It can provide affordable living and working for people, and especially young people who are trying to start up a business. The county could do that. It wouldn't cost a lot of money, and it would, and it would help to solve this affordability, housing and working affordability crisis that the whole nation is facing right now. Another person suggested bank parking. That parking, uh, it's not so much that parking is a problem. The county did create a small parking lot over here just last year. But Richard, I think you were one who suggested bank parking. Well, it's an, it's an effect already. We, oh. we went through the whole thing and the county did open it up. And we had an argument with the county to allow us, because their comment is, we can't park on a county highway. Imagine yeah. the villagers. Uh, that's another reason why they want this to become a, a town road. Well, that's part of it. Imagine uh, the state said that war. You can't park on 94. Well, I mean, really? Yeah. But there was an issue that you have to have so many handicapped spots. Handicapped. And by banking it, you can accumulate a lot of spaces. And so what that do you, you mean by have banking? Have, if you have space for three cars, yeah. you're not using two of those spaces for a handicapped and a, and a space. You need handicapped spaces. But you can, you can uh, by banking it, you need so many to so many shops and so much area. It's the whole population that has to be done. Okay, so that's so that is probably another thing that we need to deal with in the in, in, in the months and years ahead. I I also think we need to publicize more new people who have come into town. I don't know if any of you know the magazine called Dirt. Yes. Dirt is a magazine that's published by. Uh, a member of the Strauss family that owns most of the newspapers around here now. They have a wonderful story, it's running right now, about um, uh, Tim and Melanie um, Brown. Tim, Tim and Melanie. She's from France, from the Loire Valley. I'm not sure where Tim is from, but they have recently moved into the community here. They've opened a business called Cache, just up the street here, and they uh, uh, were interviewed and saying how excited they are to be in Sugarloaf and a wonderful place and this is what we hope to do and so forth. It was very inspirational and they're a young couple and we need more people like that. We need more people to come in to do that and, and we need more people like like Pat uh, who took, took over the old Rosser business when they retired and moved and now she has this wonderful shop called Marilyn. And as I said, she has brought back soap and products that, uh, that people like to buy and are crafted. And uh, so we want people like that too. We want, we want people to take businesses that have been owned by people who, for reasons of health or age or whatever, uh, want to sell, want to move away. Keep the businesses, find new people, fresh blood, young people to come in and move into those spaces and bring them back to life, to vitality. And so that's something that we need to spend more attention to. Um, and, and it's happening, it's, it's beginning to happen. We're also seeing that challenges as a result of online shopping, real challenges. Some businesses are, are that some people who I interview said, oh, this is great, you know, this is great, it opens up all new markets. Markets like Etsy. Etsy, you can. My, my son is an artist and he's marketing some design t shirts that he's made and he's doing it through this, this company, new company called Etsy. And Etsy will take crafts that are made and they'll market them for you. They'll do it all for you, the whole thing, promote it, everything, take care of it, the shipping, all of it. And, I, and he's very excited by it. And I am too. I, 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 think, I think that sounds like, like a terrific thing. Now, what about Amazon? What about um, 
people who just can't be bothered. Oh. Travel all the way up from New Jersey to Sugarloaf to buy da 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 da. When I saw something on on Google the other day that looks almost identical, I'll just order it and it'll be at our doorstep within 24 hours or less. Why make the trip cost money and gasoline and time and everything? That can present a challenge, presenting particularly to people in 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 retail, people who aren't looking for that special thing and want it made for them or something or I love the personal aspect of it. I mean, there are shopkeepers who told me, gee, you know, some of my customers I have for 20, 30, 40 years. I watched the kids grow up. I remember when little Johnny was about seven years old, and look at him now, he's 35 or 40. And, uh, and he, comes, he comes into my shop too now. And so that's, that it, it's, presented, it's presented a real problem, and it's a, and it's a fairly new problem because if you look at this technology, um, it's all quite new. For example, 1984 in the United States, the first online shopping began. In 1984, that was a long ago. That was the beginning of the age of e-commerce. Uh, in 1994, that was 84, 1994 was the first retail transaction over the web over the web. The following year, 1995, Amazon and eBay were both launched the same year. Google was founded in 1998, one of the prime search engines today. 1998, uh, all right, and that became very popular a few years afterward, about 2000, 2005, it was really taking off, Google. Um, and, and then Etsy, Etsy was founded just in 2005. Facebook was launched in 2004. Um, these are these present challenges. They have challenged, and the number of shops has has dropped. There's no question about it. We have we have we don't have as many crafts people today as we had before these new technologies, um, and so. Many of those who survive become creative. They found different ways of overcoming it. But while they were challenged by it in the 19, late 1990s and into the 2020s, um, many of them left, many of them closed out. But those that stayed, almost all of them survived COVID, for example. We thought when COVID really hit after the second year of COVID, I, I said to, wife, to my wife, boy, this is, this is really going to finish sugar loaves. This is really going to put an end to sugar loaf. But no, sugar loaf is resilient, and it's always been resilient. As I said, every time we think that sugar loaf is on its last legs, gets back up again, gets moving again, reinvents itself, or, or, or reimagines itself, or alter the dream. All through the dream. So that was that's what really makes me optimistic. Is that everybody I interviewed, I would ask, do you regret coming to Sugar Loaf? You had to do it all over again and knew what you were gonna to have to face. Did you really take it on? Absolutely. This place is more than just on time, more than my business. I love to walk up to the and so forth. Of course not. You know, We'll make it, we'll, 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 it'll work, it'll work. You see, you'll see. Just about every person I interviewed was optimistic. It's that can-do attitude that is so reassuring. And look what's happening now. The Sugar Love Community Foundation, through the hard work of Lydia Quadros, who's president, and now is their successor, Veronica Mott, they, are, they have applied to establish this as an historic district and put it on state national registers. And I thought, oh, we tried that years ago and it, it, it didn't work. Uh, there's too much opposition. Now, we just last week were approved, we've gotten through the first and most crucial stage of that application process. And now we're on our way. You know, it's like somebody finally shooting the gun and we're out of the pits and we're off and we're on the track, and I've become quite optimistic now about it.
Also, bed and breakfast. I think there's potential for Airbnbs here. Uh, I think there's potential, as I said, for affordable housing here. Um, and there might even be potential for craft beer uh, and apple jack and things. But, you know, there's just so many craft beer businesses that you can support around there. And it's definitely a boom. Uh, both my nephews, who now have the farm, because uh, my brother passed away a number of years ago, and they've taken it over. And one runs uh, a distillery and has taken a formula that the colonial period, in the colonial period would use to make apple jack, which is apple brandy. So he's making apple jack that could start up an old <laughs> 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 It has a lab, and he's producing wines. Some of the flavors are pretty good. Not all, but some are not too bad. And so he's, he's done well, too. And all wines, we run out of time. Yes. Well, I guess I